Welcome to the 40th installment of ESPN Honolulu Fan Friday Talk Story. I'm your host, Tiff Wells. With me today, he's the newest head coach here at the University of Hawaii. He's the 1987 U.S. Open champ. Spent the last two seasons with the UH women's golf team as an assistant coach. And he's now the head coach of the men's golf team. Welcome in, Scott Simpson. Coach, welcome to Talk Story. Well, thanks. Great to be here. Thanks, Tiff. Thank you for joining us. Now, first off, what or whom got you into the game of golf? I got into the game of golf um, from my dad. Uh, my dad was uh, born and raised in San Diego, and my dad was a really good uh, amateur player. He actually came from Chicago, got drafted into the Marines. He felt like he was sent halfway around the world to San Diego, of all places. He wanted to stay in Illinois, and, and once he got there, he never went back. So lucky for me. <laughs> so he started playing golf. He became a really good player. And so when I was 10 and my brother was about nine, we're one year apart, uh, we asked, hey, Dad, can we start playing golf too? And uh, he said, well, okay. So he bought us a set of clubs and I got the even ones. My brother got the odds and we started. And uh, I just fell in love with the game. What are some of your earliest memories of being on the links? Well, I, I do remember my first tournament ever, we got involved with San Diego Junior Golf. First tournament ever, I tied for fifth place, which you get a little ribbon in San Diego, with my brother. And I beat him in the playoff. So I was destined for stardom, I think. <laughs> so those, I, I just had so much fun. I just love playing. Uh, we belonged to a course that had actually three nine holes. So they would designate two of the nines. They would alternate as their like course for the day. And then the other nine was just for people to go play. And so there was usually a place for juniors to get out and play. And um, yeah, I, I had a great opportunity and just kept, I guess, having more and more fun and, and got better and better, I guess, just by doing it. If you are going out for a round, this is on your own. This isn't associated with, with you as a, as a coach. Do you prefer to walk or do you prefer to be in a cart? Uh, I prefer to walk. I mean, walking is, that's more of the game. Um, unless I'm at Oahu Country Club, then sometimes I would rather be in a car. <laughs> Maybe at least up the hill, have someone else drive it down. But no, I, I mean, I, I, I actually have walked a lot of rounds out there with David Shoji in the past. And, and uh, no, Oahu's great. Uh, I, I, I prefer walking, though. It's just it's all the tournaments, especially I would rather walk because it gives you a chance to think in between your shots. And um, yeah, that can be a good or bad thing, I think sometimes, but, but overall, yeah, I'd prefer to walk. In your mind, and this one could be a little bit tough. What is the most important golf club in your bag and why? <laughs> you know, I was always pretty good with everything. And so and I, I never felt like I stood out with anything either. Um, you know, uh, driving is really important. If you don't get it in play, you're you're behind the eight ball right <laughs> off the bat. Um, um, obviously, putting is where you make up the most strokes. Chipping and putting. Um, I'd say maybe the strength of my game was chipping around the green so or pitching. And uh, so probably the sand wedges would be the most important. Now, you were at USC in the mid to late 70s. In your mind, from the 70s to now, what's been maybe the one biggest change from in collegiate golf from when you were an athlete until now as you're a coach? Um, only everything. So <laughs> <laughs> it seems that way, at least. Um, well, no, you still get 14 clubs, so there's, there's some similarities. Um, I, I tell kids, you know, I've been teaching for a few years before I hooked up with the girls team uh, with Stephen Bidney. And, uh, and, and I, I would sometimes bring out the clubs I used to use, which is a wood wood. And they're like, what? I said, well, why do you think they're called woods? And a lot of the kids are like, well, I don't know. Yeah, they were made of wood, actually. So <laughs> persimmon woods. And so we used to use wood woods uh, with heavy steel shafts. The ball didn't go as far. The ball would curve more. The technology has really made a huge difference in, in the way we play the game. And, and especially when you're a kid, because now it's much more about power. Um, when, when I was growing up, it was more about 
trying to get the ball in the fairway because the ball would curve more. It was, it was tougher. So you had, yeah, kind of like a different emphasis on the game now. Um, but you still got to get into the hole. And, and that's where the, the short game is so important. Um, even no matter how far you hit it, you've got to put your shots close and you got to make the putts. And uh, so that part hasn't changed. Um, it just kind of the way you play and the technology has enabled you to play in a different way. So um, as far as other changes, uh, wow. I, I, I was a good junior golfer. I came in second in the U.S. junior, third in the junior world. And I was recruited by Houston, and I wrote a letter to USC. Uh, nowadays, he recruited by everybody, and you sign these letters of intent and all this stuff. So it's it's really changed in that way too. Um, much more competitive, um, which is a great thing. It's great. Uh, the more and more and more kids that can go to college and get help doing that, and uh, and enjoy the competition. Now you see almost every pro uh, comes out of college. So. Um, yeah, that's been, a, that's been a great change, too. Just the college game has really grown and grown. So, yeah, it, it's I, I think overall good changes. I'm not sold on the technology part, maybe, but making the courses because they have to play longer and longer. But um, it's, it's, it's still – the great thing about golf is it's just you out there. The coach can't take you out. You finish your round, good or bad, and um, you can't really blame anyone else. It's just you. And, and the other thing about golf, you initiate all the action. You know, that's where the mental side becomes so important in golf because um, that ball's not going to go anywhere until you hit it. So <laughs> it's a little different than some reactionary sports. It really is. And you mentioned USC, of course. You're a two-time NCAA championship medalist. You were the collegiate player of the year. I don't want to say the year, although it was in the late 70s. We've already discussed that. We've already brought it to light. But regardless if you're in a college or a golf tournament, how, how are you able to focus and just keep your mind at ease knowing to be so good, you had to put four consistent rounds together to be in consideration, you know, to be at the top of a tournament? Well, those are, those are some of the mental challenges that I think you learn, you learn with experience. Um, I read a lot too. I'd read about every great player, what they did, what they said. Uh, I read a lot of golf books on the mental and, and, and technique side too. Um, I was always trying to learn as much as I could and, and even playing with great players. What do they do? What do they do that's similar? You know, cause they, there's so many different swings out there. They look so different. Lee Trevino to Jack Nicklaus. And then now you got Matthew Wolf to, <laughs> to Jordan Spieth. They're all different, but what do they do that's similar? Because they all play great. And so I always tried to look for that. And um, But you, you, you asked a great question about the mental side with four days in a row of, of trying to be at your peak. And, and that's, that can be a struggle. And that's something you have to learn. And it's not easy to learn. And so really, I, I think that's one thing hopefully I can, I can help the help the boys with here in Hawaii is learning how to deal with that and learning how to stay on an even keel, but you want to, you want to be able to focus and at the same time, stay relaxed. And, and sometimes they seem like they're just right at odds with each other because you want to be, you're, you're excited. You get to play in a tournament you're right up in contention, but at the same time, you have to learn how to relax and, and let your swing go and to still play with freedom. And so yeah, I tell kids sometimes there's there's no real shortcut. <laughs> you just have to. You, there are things you can learn as far as breathing, as far as what you focus on and with your mind. But um, you know, then then you got to go out and practice those things. Um, I'm also big on a pre-shot routine when you hit that you that because like I said, we initiate the action. So when I do the same thing every time, and you'll see that with all the best players. They either take one practice swing, they take a couple waggles, they get they they do the same thing. That gives you a comfort zone, and, and it really helps when you're when you're really nervous. And that and that's something interesting because you talk about the the pre shot routine. We see that a lot in in basically every sport out there. For those that haven't seen you on the golf course, can you take us through if you're if you're if you're in the tee box, take us through your pre shot routine before you before you send that ball down the fairway down the middle. You mean there's someone who hasn't seen me? In the... 
playing on TV? What you mean they're under thirty years old or something or what? Uh, <laughs> maybe somebody yeah. my maybe mid thirties if I haven't seen a lot of golf. <laughs> uh, just for those that haven't been able to see you on the links or on TV. Yeah, I just I did have a kid who just looked dumb and said. I was talking to him about pre-shot routine and really emphasizing what it was. And he came back to me and said, hey, Coach Scott, I looked up on YouTube when you went to the U.S. Open, and you really did it. You did it. <laughs> I said, well, good. That's good to know. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah what, what I do and all the time is so for me, it's, it's, it's first of all, seeing the shot, visualizing the shot you want to hit. Um, do I want it to curve right to left, left to right? Where's the wind blowing? Where's the safe spot on the green? Can I go for this pin? You try to think of all those things first. And then once you decide on your shot, then I want to make a practice swing where I feel myself making the swing that's going to make that shot. Because usually we're better off on our practice swing than we are on our real swing. <laughs> like we're better off on the range sometimes than we are on the court. <laughs> so I'll take a practice swing and really feel that shot. And then I get over the ball, set the club down, get myself set. I take two waggles and I hit it. Um, I, my favorite golfer growing up, an old guy was Byron Nelson and Byron wrote a book where he talked about in his day, they didn't have gallery ropes and how much little things would bother all the players. And so he made up his mind to do his pre-shot routine and hit the shot, no matter what, unless someone walks in front of me, I guess, but no matter what hit the shot. And after, and over time, he got to the point where nothing would bother him because he knew once he started that pre-shot routine, unless it was something crazy, he's hitting the shot. And so after a while, you don't, my caddy would tell me sometimes, geez, didn't you hear that ambulance? Didn't you hear that guy jingling change or something? <laughs> Most of the time I didn't hear it actually. Cause I was, I, once you start, you're focused on your shot. And then sometimes I'd hear it, but I knew I was going to hit anyway. So um, I, I, I stress that a lot with the, with the kids. 1987, we mentioned it in the open the U S open champion. What do you remember most about that great weekend back in 87? Well, I remember uh, the next day getting on a plane to Hawaii for two weeks vacation. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty sweet with the family. We already had that scheduled. Um, <clears throat> what a great way to celebrate. And um, I mean, I, I remember a lot about that week. Um, I'm, one of the things is I was coming into that week. Uh, struggling with my game. I mean, I, I was playing well. I'd already won earlier that year in Greensboro. I was playing good, but the week before, man, I just, I was struggling and my attitude wasn't good. I was getting mad at things, you know, I was frustrated. And, um, and I, I became a Christian in 1984. So we have a Bible study on our tour. And so the guy, uh, our Bible study leader says, so what, uh, how you doing, Scott? And I said, terrible. What? I said, no, I'm just getting frustrated. I'm all, I'm just getting upset on the golf course and, you know, putting fresh, the U S open was in California. I, I was playing well. I, I, I was really probably put pressure on myself to play well. And he goes, wow, lucky for you. Our Bible studies on contentment this week. And, uh, <laughs> and it really helped just kind of refocus my mind a little bit. And so I went out there and then, and, and that's one of the things that really changed. I went out there just, changed my attitude instead of I have to play great to just say, you know, looking around and say, man, Olympic club is beautiful. Look at these beautiful Cypress trees. And, you know, and, and I get to play in the U S open instead of putting pressure on myself to try to win. I went out there with the attitude of I'm going to do my best on every shot and, and not focus on the outcome and no matter what the outcome is. And, and I think that freed me up to just to really do my best. And so I was right near the lead every day. And, um, I remember making the turn, nine holes to go. Tom Watson was one under. I was even. And, and it seemed like all the best players in the world, kind of like this year's U.S. Open. Man, we had Seve and Crenshaw, Mize, Langer, Nakajima. Everyone was right up there near the lead. And it looked like even par might, might even win the tournament. And so I make the turn, make a few pars in a row. And then uh, 14th hole, I hit in there six feet and made the putt for birdie. 15, hit in the middle of the green. Lagged this putt up there, went in the hole from 20 feet, made that for birdie. Next hole, hit a nice iron, got up there 15 feet, made that for birdie. Now all of a sudden I'm three under par. And, and I was kind of committed that week. Don't look at leaderboards, you know, just because I'm just playing my game. That's what I'm doing. 
Well, I couldn't resist. So I had to look at the leaderboard. And so here I am three under Tom Watson's two under right back in the fairway, right behind me. And uh, everyone else had gone over par. So I knew it was two man race and I'm playing against a guy who won eight majors. And <laughs> then I started getting nervous, but <laughs> I made a nice par on 17 part 18 and, and was fortunate that he didn't uh, make a long putt on 18 to put us into a playoff. But it was uh, it was just an amazing feeling because that was probably my my biggest dream as a kid was to win the U.S. Open. It just always seemed like the hardest one and the you know our national championship. And then to actually do it was like, wow, this is. I mean, it, it, it just, I still have to pinch myself. Did I really do that? <laughs> I mean, I watch it on TV this year. And like, Man, those guys are good. How did I ever win that thing? <laughs> Coach, we do need to take a break right here, so stay right there. Along with head coach Scott Simpson from UH Men's Golf, I'm Tiff Wells. You're listening to ESPN, the Honolulu Fan Friday Talk Story. Welcome back to ESPN, the Honolulu Fan Friday Talk Story. I'm your host, Tiff Wells. We're here with head coach from UH Men's Golf, Scott Simpson. Now, Coach, January 20 or June 25th, I beg your pardon, new title change going from the assistant coach position for women's golf over to the head coaching position for the men's team. How has life been in these last couple of weeks? Life's been busy. Um, I have a lot to learn. <laughs> and I'm trying, to, I'm trying to learn it as quickly as I can. Uh, as far as scheduling, traveling, as far as... Um, Wow, lots of lots to, to learn as far as compliance, uh, recruiting. Uh, I'm I, I I luckily have Stephen Bidney, the women's coach, that's really been a huge help. Um, I mean, we're great friends anyway, and and for him, he kind of stepped in there while the transition was happening and um, made sure everything was running smoothly. and And he's helping me a lot, uh, trying to get get my feet on the ground. And fortunately, I have have a, have a little more time before the. The, the boys start arriving and uh, we start practicing and um, but it, it's been it's been a lot yeah it's been a lot but it's been fun it's been it's been fun uh, learning a lot of new things and and then getting up to speed and 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 like one coach told me he says well the good thing is once you once you get all this out of the way then you get to do what you really want to do we just coach the boys <laughs> yeah. and that's why we sign up for this thing. So, um, but it's all great. Um, David Matlin, Lois, uh, man, and have been fantastic as far as, um, helping me out with everything I need to need to learn and, um, very encouraging. Uh, they've been great. So that's been a huge help too. every, everyone at UH has been great. Yeah. No one, no one looks at me like what you idiot. You're supposed to know that. No, they've been so helpful. It's been really great. <laughs> <laughs> coincidentally you mentioned coach Stephen Bidney and, and seeing him on Twitter the last couple of days there was one tweet he put out that when uh, I don't know if you if you had seen this but what goes through your mind when I look at I look at this tweet from coach Bidney and he says quote pretty neat sitting in the office with a U.S. Open champ while he's on the phone talking with a former master's champ discussing practice strategies what goes through your mind when you hear that well, I was talking to my best buddy, uh, Larry Mize, and what went through my mind while we were talking was, geez, I'm taking up all Stephen's time. I should get it somewhere else where I don't bug him so much. So <laughs> that's funny. He looked at it the other way. But, um, yeah, um, yeah, I, that's kind of funny, I think. Uh, but it, it's been fun. Um, it, it was so – it's been two great years with the with the girls' team. Um yeah, I mean, the opportunity opened up to switch to the boys, and, and, and I, I love working with everybody, but, but it was great working with the girls, and we're going to still do a lot of things together. Um, I know a few of the girls were like, what? You can't go. I said, no, I'm still here. I'm still here. Don't worry. <laughs> because, you know, you form relationships, and you, you form friendships, and uh, it's going to be great uh, with both teams, and I'm a very positive and encouraging coach, uh, same as Steven is, and I think we're going to have a lot of my goal is to have the kids, have the, the student athletes, um, kids to me, I guess, <laughs> uh, work hard and have a lot of fun. And so that's going to be our focus. You mentioned one of the things that has been something that you've been learning on the fly is, is doing the scheduling. Now, we know, of course, 
the, you know, the conference of the big West has their annual, you know, conference championships, UH of course hosts various tournaments throughout the state on different courses, different islands for some of those non-conference tournaments on the mainland. I know we can't get into specifics, but where would you like to see moving forward? Where would you like to see your team compete in various tournaments throughout the country? Oh, uh, I mean, I like the West Coast. You know, that, that would be my focus. I think it's just closer. It's a little easier with the time change and everything. Uh, depending on how good we get, um, if, if the NCAA actually the next few years is in Arizona, so – if we feel like we have a chance at some point, we'll maybe play a tournament over there to get used to every, the conditions there. Um, but, um, you know, Coach Ron left a good schedule. Um, you know, he's been doing it. He was doing it for a long time. The schedule's good the way it is. Um, you know, we'll probably look at tweaking things down the road, but I, I sure have no complaints with, the, with this coming year's schedule. And we host um, a lot, three tournaments and co-host one with UH Elo. So we'll be in the islands quite a bit. And, and then we go, all the other tournaments are on the West Coast. And, and I think that's, you know, I think UH has a little bit of a disadvantage with the time change. I think it's harder going to the East when you have to wake up super early to go for your seven o'clock tea time. And then you add in the three hours. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I think it makes it a little bit tougher. So we'll go over and make sure we get our practice rounds and get acclimated. But, um, but no, the schedule's good. It, it just to, the main thing is getting our, getting our guys prepared and ready to play great golf. <laughs> you have the distinction. And I have to tell you, because we've had a couple of fan Fridays where we've had, you know, to reschedule due to, you know, various commitments that were previously scheduled before fan Friday or, or whatnot. But I have to say, you're the first one that we've had where a guest has said, I am actually caddying for an athlete in her attempt <laughs> to make a U.S. amateur. So we have to ask, how did that go? And also when she asked you to be the caddy for her, what goes through your mind when you find that out? Well, you know, I've been working with a bunch of the kids over here. And now um, as the men's coach, I'm no, no longer can work with ninth through 12th graders. And so there's a few kids that are a little disappointed with that. But we'll <laughs> uh, hopefully down the road, we can do golf camps. And so maybe we'll be able to work with the kids in that way. Um, but uh, yeah, it was Kate Nakaoka. She's still in eighth grade. And uh, she, she asked me to caddy. She was the first one. And so I thought, yeah, that'll be fun. And man, she played great. Um, she, she really could have made it pretty easy. I think she had one caddy error where I told her to kind of punch this shot. And she whacked it and she hit it too good and uh, hit it over the green and then had a tough chip, made a double. I felt bad in hindsight why i should have just told her to punch out their short right but um you know it's things like that but but golfers we always look back on our round and oh i could have made that putt could have made that putt could have could have done that and then we forget about all the great shots we hit so i kept reminding her of man she drove a great hit a lot of great shots but it's it's fun it's fun caddy and it's fun um that's what i enjoyed so much about being the assistant coach was just being out there and uh and, and working with them when they're playing the rounds and encouraging them and, and keeping them focused on the positive. It's so easy in golf to get focused on the negative and what we do to mess up because golf, the hard part about it is we're probably most of us are somewhat of perfectionists playing a game that it's impossible to get perfect at. So it's, it's always frustrating. You shoot your best round ever and think about, geez, if I only, if I only would hit an eight iron instead of seven iron there on that 13th hole. You know, if I only would have made that 10 footer instead of lifted out. So, um, but it, yeah, it was great fun. Great fun being out there with all the girls. And we had a couple of UH girls give it a go to for the US amateur. So it was great seeing them there. And um, it's always great just being on the golf course, especially with, especially with all the, the young players. You mentioned the travel being, you know, a, a pretty, a pretty much the biggest hindrance for any, Hawaii team in terms of, you know, not just golf, but just any UH sport. So we know you travel a lot. So when you do go for a tournament as a coach, what are some of the must have items in your carry on bag? You know, the biggest thing for me traveling was always to get right on the time when I went there. And so I would, and that's what makes it easier coming this way is I could just stay up later. 
So, <laughs> and then wake up and, uh, but, but going that way, yeah, trying to, uh, trying to go to bed, you know, early as you can and, but forcing yourself to wake up, even if you're tired for a day, um, you'll get used to it. And then you get great sleep the next day. So um, the other thing is really important is water and just drinking a lot, especially when you're on the plane for five to six hours. Um, yeah, I think being hydrated is really important. Other than that, uh, you know, for, for that six hour plane ride, you know, the most important thing is probably uh, downloaded Netflix and, <laughs> and some good headphones. <laughs> A hypothetical one here, and this could be any living or past golfer. If you could complete a foursome and pick any three golfers in history, who are you picking? You know, I always hear that question. I'm always wondering about that. Probably always changes. Uh, Byron Nelson would be number one. Probably Bobby Jones. Um, I'm probably, you know what? I'd probably pick Payne Stewart. I'd love to play with Payne again. Uh, I sure miss him, man. He would have, he would have been the, the king of the champions tour out there. <laughs> what a personality. So, um, and, and he beat me. I should hate the guy. He beat me in a playoff in <laughs> the 91 U.S. Open. So, but he, you know, that's one thing about golf. You go out there, you can compete hard, and then you congratulate each other and, and uh, go get them the next time. Because really, in reality, you're playing the golf course. You're not really playing anyone else. So that's, that's another thing a little bit unique about the game. But uh, yeah, I, I guess I, I'll take those three for now. <laughs> you've played a lot of rounds. You've played many courses, not just here in the state, across the country and around the world. Is there still a bucket list item or two that you want to check off in the future? Uh, I'd probably like to go play Sand Hills and some of the courses in the, they, they've, they've taken in all this grassland, like in Nebraska and, and Kansas. Now they put in these golf courses, kind of Lynx style golf courses. So uh, playing some of those would be really fun. Um, you know, I played, I played most of the great courses. I can't think of any that, I mean, I love going to Scotland and Ireland. Um, anytime I go to Pebble Beach or up in that area is special. So, uh, you know, but I just enjoy playing. I, I love to play here in, in Hawaii. Everyone asks, what was your favorite tournament on tour? I said, well, Hawaii. <laughs> I mean, I like wildlife, but I just love being in Hawaii. So, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I was never that in, the golf course never made that big of a difference to me as far as playing. I always felt like I could play good or I could play bad almost anywhere. It was up to me. So, but I don't have any, I don't have any real big bucket list places. We mentioned the four time Hawaii state open champ, you know, seven PGA victories as well. Final question for you, coach. And again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this past April, Hawaii athletics did a, uh, debuted a series, Bo's Kitchen. Various coaches made different types of uh, dishes, including you know pasta, Korean chicken, hamburger curry, chicken katsu. If you were asked to take part, what would be your go-to dish and why? So I I do remember when they did this, and uh, Stephen Stephen did a burger, and at the time I was very glad I was an assistant coach. So. <laughs> I mean, can, I, I guess I can't cook a uh, bowl of life cereal. Um, I don't, I don't, you know what? I can grill. I can grill pretty good. Um, as long as my wife kind of gets it already. <laughs> we have summer lime chicken, teriyaki. Um, but uh, other than that, I mean, when I know when, when I took over with the kids duty, it was usually a, a tuna melt sandwich, which was kind of like that. That was probably as adventurous as I really get. So thank goodness I have, I have Cheryl who can really can cook so good. <laughs> I don't have to do that. <laughs> I, I'm sure she would tell me what to do if I had to do that. <laughs> Cookouts at Coach Simpson's house. We're all going. Coach, this yeah. has been so much. This has been so much fun. We appreciate the time you've given us today. Thank you so much for joining us and congratulations on the new position. Best of luck this upcoming season. Well, mahalo, and uh, thank you very much. And we're gonna, we're gonna, like I said, we'll work hard and we'll have fun, and hopefully, uh, the boys see some great results. We hope so too, Coach. For Coach, as well as the rest of us here at ESPN Honolulu, 
I'm Tiff Wells saying thank you so much for joining us here on the 40th edition of ESPN Honolulu Fan Friday Talk Story. Until next time, wear that mask, stay safe, be socially distant.